All right, EDS is an amazing technique. Energy dispersive spectroscopy can tell you what elements are present, where they are, and how much of them there are relative to one another. Sound too good to be true? It's pretty rad. Take a look at this micrograph. This comes from a paper that I found um, where they're looking at the, the concentration of tungsten versus cobalt. And you can see in these particles, they look like Janus particles where it's half and half roughly. And they can see where they're mapped at, which is pretty rad. Now, how do they know that cobalt and tungsten are both there? Well, they generate this EDS spectra. This EDS spectra, you can see, um, has a bunch of peaks, like it has a peak right there, it's got a peak right there, it's got small ones, and they've gone ahead and they've labeled these things. For example, they say that this first one right there is cobalt K-alpha-1, whereas this one is tungsten L alpha 1. So what on earth are they talking about? How would you label this if you got this data and it wasn't labeled? How would you know which one's which? Well, you would need to use a table. The most comprehensive tables are things like this. I don't know if you can see that. But for each element, it shows you what the values would be for over here. For this whole series, you could look up the K alpha, the K beta, the M. On the back, it's got the L series. So anyways, these are comprehensive. But most of the time, there's a couple key ones that are the strongest ones, and so we're going to use an online table. So right here, this online table comes from Joel. Joel is a uh, microscope manufacturer. They make really great microscopes, and so they've put together an energy table for EDS analysis. It is not as comprehensive as this thing that comes from EDEX, which you have to like slide this out to look at the different values, um, but it's pretty good for what you're going to do in this class. So. How did they know that this one is cobalt and this one's tungsten? Well, you would come over here to this table. Well, first off, let's assume, let's talk about what these transitions are. K alpha 1, L alpha 1, what are we talking about? Let's zoom in. Your basic understanding of an atom, like from chemistry, is not actually correct. We draw this picture all the time, like there's a nucleus and there's these shells that go around it. That's not actually correct. This is overly simplistic. But it's a good idea to show the concept that in comes your incident beam of electrons. It smacks into one of these innermost electrons, like this guy right here. It knocks it out, so this one's out of the picture now. Well, what's going to happen? Electrons that are out here are negatively charged, and they could, by falling down, they could get closer to that positively charged nucleus. So they're going to want to do that. But since energy is conserved, as they fall down in energy, they have to give off x-rays equal to this energy distance. Does that make sense? And so if you fall from here to there, you're going to have a different energy than falling from here to there. So all these transitions happen. It's not like only one can happen. They're all happening at the same time. And so what you end up with is lots of different transitions possible. Instead of individual bands, like the simple cartoon drawing, there's actually a bunch of these energy levels that are tightly together. And if you start from the second and you end at the first, all of these are called K transitions. You started from the second, ended at the first. But there's K alpha 1, K alpha 2, K beta 1. Um, K beta is going from the third to, sorry, they call it K transitions if you end at the lowest energy level. So K beta, you start at the third shell and you drop down to the first. K alpha 1, alpha 2, you drop from the second shell and end at the first, right? And so the L is when you end at the L, the second series. The K or the M is when you end at the third. But there's a bunch of these different ones available. What does this actually look like? If you look at the um, X-ray emission lines, they look something like this. So here you've got your relative intensity as a function of wavelength. You can see what's called Bremsstrahlung continuum. That It's the word for breaking in German. Why do they call it that? Well, because when you come in, uh, let's see, let's scooch this over. When you come in, you might knock out, so here's your incoming electrons, uh, or x-ray electrons. They might not hit an electron. They might just get bent. And as they bend, it changes its energy. And so you're no longer at your initial energy. You're at something less. And so that difference in energy has to be some continuum. Um, it's gonna, you're going to see not a, sin, a single peak because these can, these can happen all over the place. So instead, you're going to see a broad band of energy given off. That's your brem strahlung radiation. So again, these aren't a single peak because they're bending, and so it's going to be a over a bunch of values. So that's the background, your brem strahlung radiation. But you will have some sharp peaks, and these come from when you come, and this time now you hit one of these electrons, which causes a higher one to fall down from one of these different levels. So you're going to see sharp peaks. So we take advantage of this when we do EDS spectroscopy. Coming back over here, what you're seeing is the sharp peaks coming from EDS spectra. Okay? So 
that's where these transitions come from. That's what the K-alpha-1, L-alpha-1, all these names, different, different names mean. But how would you go about labeling this if these weren't labeled? Well, what you would do is you'd take a look at this plot, and the energy is in KeV, right? So this first peak happens just before 7 KeV, maybe 6.9 or something. So what you would do is you'd come to this plot like this, and you'd look at all your different elements, and you'd say, where am I seeing 6.9 KeV, right? So you'd zoom in, and again, this is only showing some of the stronger ones, like the K-alpha-1 here. Here it's showing K-alpha-1 and L-alpha-1. But look through here until you see the one that is 6.9. I don't see anything yet. 3.6, 4.0, 14.9. You could search, and eventually you're going to come across cobalt, which is the K-alpha-1 is right at 6.924. So that's one candidate. It is just a candidate. There might be other ones that occur at the same spot. Let's snoop around a little bit and see if we see any. Yeah, how about... Um, Going across the series, let me move this out of the way. How about right here? It could also be erbium, right? That's also at almost the exact same position as cobalt. Cobalt was 6.924, so 6,924 electron volts. This one's at 6,947. So it could well be erbium, right? Now, hopefully, if you made this sample, you could say, well, I didn't think I added any erbium, so that's probably not an erbium peak. But there is always a little bit of detective work. If you're uncertain, then what you'd want to do is look for the second peaks. Well, cobalt has another peak at 776 EV. In this figure, we don't see that. It only goes down to 5 keV, so 5,000 EVs. So we would have to look way over here to see if that's it. But you could look at other peaks, like erbium has one at 1.4, and this one's got another one at... Uh, so you'd have to either look at a broader spectrum or look at some of the other peaks to confirm it. In this case, for example, it's not listed on this table. You only got, for cobalt, the only thing listed is K-alpha. But if you went to a more complete table like this one here, it has K-beta, right? So we slide this over to K-beta. See that little black line? I'm sliding it over to K-beta. Okay, now it's at K-beta. And then I look for cobalt. Cobalt right there, it says... 7.64, sorry that's hard to read, but it says 7.64. And sure enough, in this plot, right here between 7 and 8, you've got 7.64, and there's the cobalt K-beta-1. So you know for sure that it's cobalt and not erbium. Um, to make sure, you'd want to check that erbium also doesn't have a peak there. So when I check erbium, erbium um, is right over here. It's got peaks at 55, 1, 1 1.4, 1.6, 1.8. 12, 14, that's it. And on the other side, the L series peaks, it has peaks at, where's erbium? Right here. So it's got peaks at 6.15, 7.06, 6.9, 7.8, 8.1, 9.8, 9.3, 1.9, 2.1, 2.3, 2.4. Nothing at um, at 6.7 like this one. So we know that it's cobalt, not erbium. This makes sense. Um, that's how you fill out these charts. Same thing with tungsten. How do we know that this is tungsten here? You look here, it's between 8 and 9, maybe 8.3. And in this table, when you look over here at tungsten, yeah, 8.396. So we know that that's um, tungsten and not something else. Okay, so that's how you go about labeling these tables. It's a little bit of trial and error. It's a little bit of detective work, which is kind of fun. You're doing like forensic science, but for materials. You're trying to figure out what material is it based off of a bunch of clues that it leaves behind. So that's how you uh, label these EDS diagrams. Hope that's helpful.